elephant over here now this elephant is quite a older elephant it's probably I would say now must be about I would say eight or nine years old maybe a little bit younger seven maybe seven or eight but look there no tusks that you can see coming out so this individual is tuskless it does not have any tusks growing and this is something that we've been seeing more and more of over the last few years <clears throat> particularly from the females and there tends to be a lot of female elephants that carry this gene that they don't grow tusks at all now there's a lot of theories as to why they don't have tusks and I personally am not 100% sure of which theory I actually believe. I don't think any of them really ring true just yet, and there will be a reason for it. I have a funny feeling it might be something to do with diet or with some sort of nutrient deficiency that they have that when they are growing inside of the mother that they get a little bit of an issue and they don't actually grow those tusks properly. That's something like that. I don't know if they may be because a lot of people are saying that they're evolving against hunting to not produce tusks but then you would see it in male offspring as well where as it's only in the females and we know that the females don't use their tusks nearly as much to defend themselves so it could be something to do with that now Leslie you're wondering how much their trunks weigh in an adult male elephant the trunk will weigh 300 pounds of just pure muscle so that's how heavy the trunk is which is absolutely amazing when you think that it's just a basically a modified nose for it to weigh 300 pounds imagine having a 300 pound nose that would be quite an unfortunate problem to deal with but in the elephant world being the size that they are it is most certainly anything but a hindrance it is perfect for them to sustain themselves and to survive they're able to use it to drink to eat to even defend themselves somewhat are you also going to come say hello you lot are very relaxed hello and off she goes <laughs> so cool Suma, you're wondering how many species of elephants there are in Africa. Well, there's just one, the African elephant, but there is a subspecies, which is known as, well, two subspecies, the desert and the forest elephant, and then you've got the savanna elephant, so I suppose three subspecies under the general banner of an African elephant, but only one actual species of animal, and then the subspecies that are dictated by their environment that they spend most of their time in. There we go. There's another screenshot for James. Quickly, everybody, capture that and tag James Hendry. There we go. That will fill him with delight, I'm sure. I feel like James is going to probably be quite upset with me at some point if we just keep flooding his whole Twitter page with all kinds of pictures of animals defecating, but, well, it will be worth a laugh anyway. So it's just the one species, and then, like I say, according to area and small little changes that they have, so the forest elephants being much smaller, as well as the desert elephants, then what you see in these savannah elephants allows them to then become a subspecies, but it's just the African elephant itself. The only other species of elephant in the world is the Asian elephant, which obviously occurs in India and through Sri Lanka and parts of Indonesia as well. So that's the two species in their distribution range interesting that there wasn't an elephant species in South America or in the Americas or should we just say in the Americas as general it would surprises me that there wasn't one that developed in those areas or habit was in sort of the big vastness if you think about how much space that is in the big jungles of South interesting well I'm certainly not complaining that we're the ones that have got them now our herd has drifted off slightly so I'm going to try and just get back towards where they are and back into the front of them so we can watch them coming again now <laughs> Alice apparently says to me that I have to say that we are going to ponder what goes on with these elephants and that I must link to Scott in a South American accent. Now what exactly is a South American accent, Alice? Because, well, there's many countries in South America and don't say Mexican because I think Ali might shoot you if you do. Now there's a big odd fog burrow that we've just gone. So I'm just going to link to Scott anyway and not use a South American accent because I'm not sure which one it is. But the next time we go to Scott, if Alice gives me a specific country, we shall try and use that one. Well, thank you, Tristan. And these five cheetah have pancaked themselves onto Termite Mound. You could drive past them so, so easily. And it's actually 
boggling my little mind as to how easy you could easily you could drive past five cheetah. I heard you were discussing different types of elephant and zebra. I wish that I could have seen a woolly mammoth when they were still wandering around or when we were still wandering around in just skins with clubs. Another elephant that would be nice, they don't exist, but hypothetically speaking would be a pygmy elephant. You get a pygmy hippo, which is very cool. So, I mean, imagine if there's a pygmy elephant, wouldn't that be great? Quick update here. As you can see, the cheetahs are sleeping. The wildebeest have cleverly moved off a short distance, but they are still very, very much within the sights of this coalition. And judging from the behavior that I've seen in the past from these boys is that they're going to wait for darkness to begin to set in. Possibly, you, yeah, we should actually still be on safari because it's half an hour later this evening. So we could well be on safari when they do decide to make a attempted hunt on these wildebeest. The last kill they made with us was at quarter to eight. So 15 minutes after the safari finishes. Of course, if there is good action though, we'll keep you updated as to whether we're going to go on live on Facebook or whether we're going to extend the safari. But very, very good prospects. I'm very excited for VM, who's on camera with me, who is desperate. He said he's going to retire after he gets a good cheetah hunt. I don't think this one will qualify because it won't be in perfect sunlight. But VM is basically on the road to retirement. So for those of you who enjoy his camera work, um, best you make the most of it because he's going to be living, I think, remotely, semi-nomadically, out of his vehicle and his caravan trailer tent come home in the next few weeks. <laughs> okay. There's quite a strong wind blowing. That's going to assist in creating confusion and chaos when these guys start running in like a pack of wolves into these large herds of wildebeest. And they basically just run in and kind of chase them at, at fairly random intervals and not necessarily together as, as a team. But then one of them manages to single out a young store, get on one, and then the rest of them come barreling in to help subdue it. Because even a young wildebeest is quite a handful or a pawful for a single cheetah. So that's why these guys have become so, so effective. Another thing that's interesting that I was thinking about earlier is that they may well never have hunted together in scenario in a scenario like this during the migration. Like I said a bit earlier, they only join together well, they've only been noted in this area as of December. So they're not sure where they came from. There's speculation that one of the males has come from Tanzania. We're going to rush you across to James and I'll continue the story later. Hello, everybody. We've got a beautiful vulture here. I'm not sure why we rushed across here. Anyway, here we, here we are. We have a vulture. It doesn't seem to be going anywhere at all. Big leopard faced vulture. And just very nicely framed there on the termite mound. Huge bird. With a wingspan of some nine feet. Now, if we zoom out from there, and we look over the top, underneath that rainstorm, you up to about there, all the way to the end. You can just see the top of my hat there. Uh, well, and even beyond that. If you pan to the right there, Manu. Yeah, onto those hills there beyond. And just brighten the picture slightly. And what you can see are numberless herds of wildebeest. You can just sort of make them out there. Any discoloration that you see on that hill is numberless wildebeest. And that is where we are going. And that is where I'm hoping that we are going to get the Salt Lake Pride. I'm very sorry to have dragged you over from Scott at high speed. I, I think I gave the wrong impression about how urgent the sighting was. Anyway, we're going to carry on over the top here. Rebecca, do you want to get back to Scott? Ah, you can stay with us. No problem. Scott is now putting the ME20 low-light camera onto his vehicle, which will allow for him to take very beautiful night shots of the cheetah killing more wildebeest. 
this is really, when we get over the top of this hill, you're going to be so amazed. Rebecca is so excited that she wants to be soy amazed. Wait, I will soy amaze you all shortly. Not by my own hand, but simply by facing the vehicle in the right direction. Goodness gracious me. Right, Manu, onto the far ridge there. There we go. Look at that. And Rebecca is already soy amazed, which is a great relief because I'd be very sad if she hadn't been. Isn't that nice? So we're going to get in amongst them and see if we can't find those other lines. If we don't find those lines, I will probably give up. Right, in the meantime, let's head across to Tristan, who apparently is in and amongst the elephants. Well, we're still just trying to catch up with our Ellies. They're moving a lot quicker than they were just now. Just now it was all sedate and we weren't really going too far. And now they kind of getting going a little bit so I'm just trying to catch up with them and try and find a better way to position myself that we get to see them without having to move too much I would rather be a slightly ahead of them oh center if you can try and just go straight ahead of me into this grass here I'm gonna duck out the way whether we're gonna see them or not is anyone's guess but there are button quails inside there there the, oh, was that I thought that was one of them but it's just grass moving it's tiny tiny little birds that are inside here where have you gone no button quails, come out. Is that one sitting there? No, that's a leaf. Difficult to see, actually. The sensor's trying to look, scan in the grass there for me. Uh, There's too much wind, we can't see the movement of our button quails. Sensor, I'm going to try and move, just watch that spot, maybe we'll see them. But there was most definitely some button quails that were lurking in this little thicket. And they're so difficult to get on camera. No, our button quails have moved off. Oopsie. As are our elephants. Our big female is just guiding her young ones slowly away. There we go. And lots of flapping of ears this afternoon, given that it is so warm. It's very warm if you're a big grey beast with the sun hitting your back. So you have to flap your ears a little bit just to stay nice and cool. And you can see the young one. It stops every now and then is feeding. And I wonder if it's going to move that branch, if it's learned that trait yet from its mom. As they get older, they will learn that they can move trees around to get to what they want underneath. No, not quite. Not just yet. Trying, though. And you can see that one's little tusks are starting to show. So that one is about five or six years old. Cat's paws, you want to know if elephants ever come into camp? Well, yes, they most certainly do come to the fringes of camp. I haven't seen one yet come into the gate and towards FC. We have a little gate close to, our, to the final control and to the DRC, but they do certainly walk right past it and feed and munch away. Chantal has had some behind the house, I think, or Connor, I can't remember, one of the two of them. They had... Ellie is somewhere behind. They live next. They used to live next door to each other. So I think there was Ellie's behind there at some point. I remember somebody telling me that one of those rooms. I can't remember. I'm getting old. Can't remember who's who and who's been in whose room because well, it's changed so much since I've been here. All the Mara guys have left and new rooms, and so people have gone into different rooms. And well, it's just all quite complicated at this stage. But yes, they do come around. When I was at Chitwa and Lion Sands. And Simambili, they were a permanent fixture at all of those camps. They used to come in all the time. And the reason why they come into camps so much is because camps water gardens for the plants around the lodge to make it look pretty. And when it's dry and 
like it is now, then you know what that means? That means elephants want to eat nice pretty plants and therefore they come in and they destroy nice pretty gardens and soon you're left with an absolute mess. But if we go up just from the baby for two seconds, Senzo, if you look at that female, you can see that she is pregnant. Look at how wide she is. You can see the hips there, and then beyond the hips is a lot of swelling at this stage. So she is probably quite heavily pregnant, I would imagine. She's almost as round as she is tall at this stage. So that is a good sign. It's always nice to see pregnant females. Uh, it's very encouraging when the population is going up rather than down. Although the elephant population in the Kruger is not struggling at this stage at all, they are steadily increasing every single year. There's not very much that the elephants have to worry about here in South Africa. There is a bit of poaching that's starting to happen right in the northern part of the Kruger, but other than that they don't really suffer from disease. There's not too many predators around that hunt them, particularly in this system. There's so many other prey species that can be hunted by lions and leopard and all these others that elephants really don't form part of the menu that much and so find that the elephant numbers are just exponentially increasing. We've also had a number of good years of rain which has meant a lot more vegetation and so the elephant numbers have done very very well. That coupled with artificial water points means that the elephants find water easily and there's no longer these long journeys to trek from water source to water source that might have killed off older or younger weaker individuals and so that's why their population is slowly on the increase. It's not to say that it's a bad thing. There's a lot of studies about it. And John, you're wondering if the dry grass they're eating has any nutrients in it. John, the grass that we see on above the surface of the soil, absolutely not. It's all just dry and there's very little in it. But what they are trying to get is the roots of that grass. So they pull the grass in chunks and you'll find they eat the bottom half of the grass. So they're eating all the root system and that's where grass stores its nutrients and its moisture to keep it alive. And that's what they're actually targeting and there is nutrients in that. And then they'll supplement that with a lot of leaves and bark and roots at this time of the year. Right, Senzo, before our ellies disappear, let's try and catch up once again because they are moving off slightly. This area is a bit of a minefield though. There's the odd aardvark burrow, there's the odd warthog burrow. You've got to be a little bit careful. There's a few sickle bush around which is a tire hazard of note. So just trying to be careful of those as we're going along as well. Caitlin, who's 10 years old, hello Caitlin, you want to know how thick is an elephant's skin in centimeters. Now in centimeters, it depends where we look in Caitlin, because on their body they have different thicknesses of skin. So around the ears, we know that the skin, particularly on the back side of the ear, is very, very thin. But on the other side, so down the body and, and that area, that skin is going to be very thick. So on the ear, only a few, probably not even a centimeter thick, it'll be millimeters, whereas on the body it's Itself, you're probably finding in places it's going to be close to five to ten centimeters thick so it's very thick on the body and the trunk as well the trunk has got very thick skin to try and keep that trunk in good condition remember they're grabbing thorny trees with their trunk so they have to have strong skin on their trunk as well so it's also very thick there and five centimeters is about what the thickness is of the trunk itself now the reason why I actually know the thickness of the trunk more than anything else is because unfortunately we had an elephant bull that died in in this area actually a chitwa just on one eye pan close to the dam there and that poor elephant bull um, because he was he died and, and they have to remove the tusks so that poachers don't come and steal them the easiest way to remove the tusks when the carcass is still fresh is to actually cut the trunk away first and then get to the tusks like that and we actually had to take the trunk off and it was quite something to try and get through the skin then through the muscle and through that area and it was not a very pleasant experience and something I hope that I'll never have to repeat again but very interesting just to have a look at and like I say the animal died of natural causes so it wasn't like there was a poaching incident or anything like that and I suppose it was no longer with us so cutting its trunk and looking and seeing all of those things up close was not actually a bad thing it was a great learning experience and that's how vets and various other things learn as well but this has just been so magical this afternoon they're so relaxed 
this particular group. They've not in any way worried about us and we've followed them through quite thick bush and crashed a few trees as we've gone with them and as you can see we haven't had a head shake, none of the mothers have been upset, they haven't in any way given us any trouble so it's been rather pleasant now you can see the grass that's in there well that's actually the ear hole sorry Senzo. but there's the grass and you'll find you see it's the bottom sections that it's eating of course now an elephant would walk right where the grass was naughty little elephant now, of course it's not naughty it's just doing what it's supposed to do but in the purposes of what we were trying to see it, it didn't really help very much but you can see it's got its trunk down pat already so this is an elephant that you can see the tusks would it easily like I say be about five six years old and so that trunk is working absolutely fine and you can see just watch how it just strips the leaves off these small branches there we go strips them and shoves them in now I know I can't remember who it was but somebody was asking the other day of why we can't see the elephant's teeth this might be the prime opportunity to see them this little one the way it's got its head cocked up we might be able to see the teeth as it pulls food in although it's turned its head slightly if it faces us we might be able to see some of the teeth if you look at that right hand corner of the mouth there might be a visual of some of those big broad plate like teeth on that right hand area just as it opens although we'll have to wait for it to take its head out of the bush if we're going to get lucky and actually see that the only time I've seen elephant teeth regularly is on the bull elephants so if you park near the bull elephants and they come and feed near you and they often feed quite high up and because of their height in comparison to the vehicle you actually look up into their mouth and you can then often see the teeth that way but otherwise very very difficult to see I thought we might get a lucky break there and see this little one's teeth but unfortunately it's now buried its head deeper into the thicket and is turning the wrong direction Maybe now, let's see. Come on, open your mouth wide. Oh, there's too many branches in the way. No, almost there. <laughs> let's see if we can see them. Oh, come on, if it turns one more time like it did just now, we might be able to get to see those teeth. Of course, we are seeing its teeth anyway in the form of the modified incisors that are coming out between, well, on either side of the trunk in the form of the tusks. Those are modified teeth that we see, so... They are not horns in any way, it's not bone, it's exactly what your teeth are made out of. Here come some of the younger ones, you can also hear a bit of gas that's being passed, which is quite normal for an elephant herd. Charles in charge, you want to know how far a elephant's trumpet would travel. Now, Charles in charge, I wonder if you are saying in terms of our hearing or in terms of their hearing because that's two very different things. Our hearing, you can probably hear elephants trumpeting depending on obviously wind and thickness of the bush as well as the sort of terrain that you're in if you're in dips and troughs and, and um, high areas. But I would say you could probably hear elephants trumpeting from three, four kilometers away if they're really trumpeting properly. In terms of Elephants themselves, I would imagine you could probably treble, even quadruple that distance that they would be able to start picking it up. So the thing is with them is that they actually have sensory cells that are in the, even the tip of their trunk and their feet that are able to pick up the vibrations caused by sound waves and they can actually hear themselves from 15 kilometers, which is really quite something when you think about it, if long, how long it's taken us to be able to communicate over 15 kilometers that elephants can do it naturally is quite something. Right, they've moved off again into a little green belt thicket in front of me here, so I'm just going to try and catch up once more. It's amazing how when they do decide to move, they go quite quickly. <laughs> now, I'm not sure where this has come from and why we are doing this, but apparently I need to go to Scott and I need to do it in an accent. At first was a Bolivian accent, which who knows what that is. I even tried to Google it while I was out here quickly because I had a bit of cell phone reception and I can't find anything on a Bolivian accent. So now they want any accent whatsoever, but you can't put me on the spot with this. I need to have prep time to be able to say it. So I'll do it the next link. How about that? Senzo, do you have an accent that you want to do? I do? Anwar's accent. <laughs> so we'll have to think about Anwar's accent and we'll try to do it a little bit later. But let's go across to Scott and see what he's up to and if he's still with those beautiful Cheetah brothers. 
<laughs> well, I'm glad you well, got, some, glad humor you got some humor Tristan from Senza. Tristan Senza. I cannot, I cannot to, wait to look at that whole episode unfold. I'm trying out the new presenter cam. It's a new piece of equipment that I haven't got used to, so that's why I'm leaning very closely to it. It's only about eight inches from my nose, and it's quite a nifty little toy. It was one of the improvements, I guess, to our equipment. If you look ahead, there are five cheetah and you are now on the main camera they are all lined up and poised like a military operation like i say waiting for the cover of darkness to wreak havoc and terror with the herd of wildebeest which is just to the left hand side of them it's actually slowly grazing towards them look at those beautiful rays of sunshine bursting through the clouds another very very splendid moody afternoon here in the Masai Mara now you know in an ideal world be a little bit too big for the cheetahs so they'll be looking through the search for any youngsters let's have a look and see if we can find any youngsters in here not that we want to seal their fate for them but well, there doesn't seem to be too many small ones here so we may have an epic showdown where these five boys try and bring down a big wildebeest and I have been told that they do that fairly often about whew, maybe a week two weeks ago everything kind of blends into one big safari out here to be honest that took half an hour to uh, bring down a fully grown wildebeest so I kind of trying to liken that to lions hunting buffalo it's a very similar match equally dangerous for these cheetah to hunt wildebeest as it is for lion to hunt buffalo so it could be something a little bit nerve-wracking for all of us but again the predators do come unstuck from time to time it's not just their prey who is unlucky for now though all is calm and peaceful very strong wind still blowing let's hope it doesn't continue into the evening and then blow our blankets away and I'm very, very happy to hear that it's not just me that's very excited for the prospects of this evening. If I were you, I would phone a friend, spread the love of Safari Live and let them know what they're about to miss out on. It'll certainly assist in us taking you to different safari destinations around the world. Something coastal would be quite nice to mix it up. Coastal safari. Mm-hmm. Palm trees, underwater, snorkeling, scuba diving. Hello, Audrey, who's just 12 years old. You would like to know what the chances are of a cheetah jumping onto the car while we are sleeping. And to be honest, Audrey, I don't think there's a good chance of a cheetah doing that while we are sleeping. However, during the day, they sometimes like to jump up onto the hoods of the vehicles to use it as a vantage point. Just like they climb up onto termite mounds, they will jump onto the hoods of the vehicles, sometimes even the roofs of the vehicles, and get a better view. Now that is something that we as humans should not really promote, as cool as it is, and I would love to have it happen if no one was watching, but that's not how we should think, because by letting it get so close to us, it eventually may mean that it may hurt somebody, even if it scratches somebody by mistake, and then who knows what they will do to that cheek. So there is a limit that we should rather kind of chase them off when they get a bit close rather than letting them get too friendly. Having said that, though, VM and I were discussing today that there are um, there is a chance that possibly a lion or a hyena, it won't even need to jump into the vehicle. It could just walk up to the side of the vehicle and grab onto our toes and pull us off. But uh, hopefully that's not going to happen. And we <laughs> we're generally keeping an eye out. But there is a small chance that could happen. To be honest, I'd rather that happen than something else in this world we live in. So, um, yes and no. It's not going to be a, a realistic problem. Thankfully, I think if you're sleeping under a bush all alone without any lights in the vehicle, without any other people snoring and switch, uh, kind of switching around in their, on their mattress, then that would be a little bit different. But I think we are safe for now. 
Hello, James. You're interested to know at what age would a young male cheetah start struggling to join a coalition? I'm told anywhere kind of upwards of two and a half years of age, it starts becoming tricky for them to be allowed into a boys club. Um, but again, I would be interested to know if any of you have found any research or documents that states otherwise. One thing that fascinates me about wildlife and especially African wildlife because I know more about the, the African wildlife than, than the other continents is that you get the same species of animals occurring widely through through sub-Saharan Africa yet their behavior depending on where they live the exact same species can be very very different let's take hyena for example the clans here are huge and Juma they're small yet they're exactly the same animal and their behavior in those clans changes so it can kind of be likened to us as humans. Some countries, people get married young. Some people, some countries and cultures, people have forced arranged marriages. I mean, just us as one species is a great example of how different we can act, behave, eat, sleep, drink, work, you name it. So cheetah are the same, leopard are the same, lion are the same. They've all kind of got their own traits, personalities and trends depending on where they are. But yes, around two to two and a half years of age, I'm really looking forward to trying to work out more about these guys. And it's really, oh, I forgot to continue my story from earlier. Um, basically, not much is known about this coalition. They came into the area in December last year. Nobody's sure if any of them are brothers. There's, you know, high likelihood that possibly two pairs of the four or two pairs out of the five are brothers. But some scat analyses that are going to be analyses. I don't know if that's correct, but we'll roll with it. Um, they have done some scat samples, and they are waiting to be DNA tested. So we will know for certain in the coming weeks who is related to who out of this coalition. I'm also told one other little bit of information is that one of these guys was born with a sister so his sibling was a sister and his mother was a Tanzanian cheetah so he has skipped the border and come north into Kenya uh, other than that I don't think any of these cheetahs whereabouts backgrounds anything is known about them so really looking forward to trying to work out what it is or you know as much as we can about them and it looks like for now it's going to be safe to send you off to another African predator with Mr. James Henry. I think I thought Scott for a moment there was referring to me as an African predator. I was about to be complimented. And no, I'm not. Uh, there we have way in the distance and the reason they're in the distance is because they're in the bottom of a signal free valley is the salt lick pride and two more of them are way off to the right hand side we've lost sight of them now a mating pair but the reason we've stopped in this area is because of the vast number of wildebeest and if we tilt up we can see the herd that we were in amongst earlier and the herd that you saw earlier that massive herd is actually just behind us and I'll take you driving through them right now and I'm hoping desperately that this wind that's blowing does not mean rain because every single time I've come up into this area I have got hit by storms and in fact the last time which was Sunday last two weeks ago um, Fergus and I got stuck for two and a half hours. We were running from the storms. Everyone was very worried about us, you know. They thought maybe we'd been blown away. Except, of course, Mrs. Wallington, who's English, and said they can't die of rain. She was, of course, correct. So I think they're probably going to hunt, well, I hope they're going to hunt that herd a little bit later as it gets a bit darker. The flatness indicates to me that they've probably eaten 74 wildebeest in the last two hours, and so I'm not convinced they're going to get up and do anything. Right, come with me now. What we're going to do is just take a little drive around through this vast swathe of life over here. Look at that. Is that not too gorgeous? Not them having a
panic attack. I think they've come out of the salt lick where they're probably... There would be panic and that would be horrible. I think, try and think of the biggest crowd you've ever been in amongst. I mean, I think probably rock concerts. I imagine the U2 concert. I think that's the biggest cr crowd I've ever been in amongst. And I suspect that around these planes, Possible to try and actually looking behind me to see if our lions have decided to get up. I think that storm there. Now, if your questions are not being answered, it's not because we're ignoring you. There is a few. Um, there is a few. No, James. There are a few. We will try and maintain a stream. I can actually see the camp now. So. Now, as we drive through here, what's interesting is that, and uh, yes, Rebecca, I can see you waving at us. What you can see is that the Volubius have very quietly made a circle around us. And that's what they do around the lions. They will know where those lions are quite probably. Well, not anymore, not this group. But if you come around the big group of wildebeest and you see a dent in the side of it or an irregular shape, you can be almost certain that around that irregular shape there will be a lion. Or some other predator, perhaps four cheetah. I think this is very, very entertaining. I mean, I don't know about you, I've certainly never seen this number of animals in one place before. Sun about to set behind us, huge storm in the offing. Tremendous, tremendous stuff. going to ease up to the top of the ridge here and once we're up there we should be able to see down over the top into the rest of the herd and from there we won't be able to go any further to the west because we will unfortunately lose the signal. Now as pretty as that is, it's not as pretty as the sight that I can see with my eyes and that is because as I've said to you before, oops, Unfortunately, I hit a stump there. That's why they started to run. Um, the camera is exposing for the brightest parts of the screen. And so when you look into the sun, the wildebeest become dark. But our eyes are so clever that we can expose for both at the same time. So those wildebeest, to me, look a lot brighter than they do to you. very nice. I am a little worried about the weather but the last four times I've said that we haven't been rained upon so I'm just going to keep saying it in the hopes that I'm warding it off. And the weather is starting to cool slightly. It's quite nice. We'll have to start putting jerseys on shortly. I believe Scott is doing that now. Of course, if you're a white-bearded GNU like these chaps, you don't have any jerseys. Yes, R Rebecca, we can absolutely stop. I just want to get over the top of this hill, if you don't mind. Another one minute and then I will stop. Rebecca wants to hear them GNUing. Yes, 
stop the other side of this termite mound. Alrighty, let's head back across the Juma while we get to the top of the hill. Apparently they have got a sunset to show you. Now we've just got the most beautiful scene of the sun slowly heading towards the Drakensberg Mountains and below that is our herd of Ellies that is slowly but surely making their way along below the sunset and moving just around us a little bit. There's one or two that have come towards the car but there is one that is sitting almost directly underneath the sun at this stage so we will show you that just now when we admire the sun for a few moments. Isn't that beautiful? Not many better ways to end the day than to watch that. And you can see quite a bit of dust on the horizon. You can actually you can't even see the mountains today. From here you should see the mountains quite clearly. And the sun itself, there's a big ring. And that's from the wind that we've had. It's kicked that dust up and caused that to be a little softer than it normally would be. There's the mountains just through all the dust that you can see in the distance. Riti, you say you love the Juma sunset colors. Well, Riti, I agree. They are beautiful, although I have seen some incredible scenes from the Mara. Those sunset thunderstorms that they tend to get there is also absolutely wonderful. So the two of them both have equally beautiful sunsets. And there are elephants just making their way through the shot as well. Isn't that beautiful? Very nice, Enzo. Well done. I quite like that. Ellie's strewn under a African sunset. Now, I'm not quite sure where I'm going to be able to go from here because <laughs> we have a situation where we are firmly stuck between a whole bunch of trees and Ellie's in every direction. Hello, my girl. This is one female right here. You can see how large she is. That's the pregnant female that's just walking past us. Big girl that's dwarfing us at the moment. And then here comes... Actually, no, it's not the pregnant female. I lied. Oh, they're both pregnant. They're both looking where they might be. I think comes the actual fully pregnant, you know, the one that's showing a lot more than the other one. You can see, look at how big she is in front of the car in comparison to some of the other ladies. You play so cool. Hey guys. Look at how she just waits for all the herd to go. She's also found herself a really nutritious treat. That's for the sickle bush that she's been eating, and the sickle bush has lots of nutrients and as you find down in the south of the Sabi Sands there is lots of it and that sickle bush is like I said targeted heavily by the elephants you also find varying other species that eat it like kudu and giraffe but the ellies really love it and that one is dead I think so she's trying to feed off a different plant but it's, it doesn't look as though it's actually got any live vegetation she's kind of brunching her trunk through all the dead stuff it is such a beautiful scene we've got elephant we've got setting sun it is magic Joshua are you wondering if elephants will avoid any species of tree um, I'm just trying to think Joshua if, of species of trees that I've never seen an elephant eat I must be honest I've never seen them feeding off a sandpaper raisin it's not to say that they don't, because we don't get that many sandpaper raisins in this area. Oh, look at those long eyelashes and that deep amber eye hidden behind them. You can see the pupils dilating quite a lot because that's the side away from the sun, which is getting quite dark now. Um, but I've never seen them eat sandpaper raisins. Um, I haven't seen them... I'm just trying to think what other trees are out here. I've seen them feed off quarries. I've seen them feed off cluster leaf, bush willow jackalberries so all of those species of trees there's actually not many that I can't think of you might find there's the odd succulent that grows careful where you throw those sticks <laughs> we're in hazards zone at the moment there's twigs being thrown all over the place and we, we hopefully won't get a sickle bush branch on us because a sickle bush has got nasty spines so I don't know if you can just see on the branch here there's these hard spines that are on there and those hard spines are lethal to one's hands and feet and anything else. I had a spine from a sickle bush going to my thumb one.
Wow. How cool was that? That is so epic. Now I can assure you that that is the elephant and not my stomach or Senzo's stomach. We were fed well at lunch this afternoon. So that is the elephant making that sound. How amazing is that? So I was saying to you that the spine actually went into my thumb and unfortunately I didn't notice that it was in there because it kind of made like a little blood scab over the top and about eight weeks later it was still really painful and eventually I managed to pull out this about an inch long thorn from underneath my fingernail and it was not very pretty at all it got quite infected and it wasn't very nice so sickle bush is not a friendly plant at all and you can see some of those spines just on the branch there and it amazes me that Ellie's can deal with it because that spine is very hard the spine is a modified leaf and so it's you would think would be quite soft in comparison to the thorns but it's actually much harder than what thorns are no girl you're gonna throw that on me behave yourself oh look at that sunset now as well Senzo I know she's really close and it is beautiful to see her you just watch that tree now James you want to know whether or not the baby elephants can feed off the cambium layer like the adults can well as soon as they get tusks then yes they watch the adults and they start practicing it already and so they can start to show signs of being able to do it and it really does happen even in the young ones they tend to wait a little bit and they only really get the strength to be able to dig the tusk in and rip off a little bit later in life so after they've gone through their formative years and they start reaching their teens is when we start to see it for the first time but there you can see Marip's Corp and if you look very carefully you can actually see the towers that our signal gets broadcasted from. There's little spikes on there. I think those are them. They're somewhere on that northern tip there. And those receive the signal from where we are and send it all the way to all of you. Michael? Okay. But you... Look at this. This is so cool. She's sitting right in front of us at the moment. She was just stopping just to see what we were and making sure we weren't an issue. And she's now going to move on. Or is she? Is she going to just sit here? Mm -hmm. No, she's moving on. So we'll just watch the last of the sunset going down. Now, I believe Inno has sent me a video of her doing her accent for all of us. So this is a real treat. And while our Ellie's move away and the sun is setting, I'm just going to try and pull up our video and see if we can't watch Innocentia doing her thing. Hold on. So we want to pause it. We don't want it to start just yet. All right. Are we ready for this? We'll give it two more minutes as the sun just dips over the back end of the Drakensberg Mountains. It's amazing how quickly that sun does go down. And I would say in 10 seconds, we're going to have it down. There we go. Beautiful. And gone. Very cool. Right. Now, we're just going to quickly play our video of Innocentia. So there's Innocentia. Say hello to Innocentia, everybody. Now, hopefully, this is going to be loud enough. I'm going to have to turn the sound up. Let's see. So this is Innocentia's accent of like Anwar. Oh, why is it not playing? It doesn't seem to want to play now. There we go. <laughs> so that was very very good well done you know i'm very impressed <laughs> that's fantastic it was just like anwar was here i'm very very happy now our sun is set but it sounds like there is a sunset in the masai mara so i'm going to send you all to the masai mara so you can go and hang out with scotty and the sun that's setting I'm not sure if the accent that um, Rebecca gave was the same one that Tristan gave. It sounded like something like a, well, a sort of a um, southern ripoff, if you like. Anyway, here we are with our sunset, and I think a very spectacular, spectacular thing that we're watching here. Hundreds of thousands of wildebeest, because I'm saying hundreds of thousands because it sounds impressive, but there may only be 20,000, uh, are moving past us. And there's a storm dropping water out of the sky. There are these funny bulbous clouds above us whose names I have forgotten. And somebody can tell me if you like. Hashtag Sorry Life. Just above there. 
Um, they do have a name, actually. Forgotten what that is. Anyway, it is a very, very astounding thing to be in amongst. And everywhere you look, there is beauty. Off to the eastern side, away from the sun here, there's a lovely tree framed by some very beautiful clouds. There we are. Is that not nice? Nice. Did I really use that? My English today has been utterly appalling. Rebecca says, Ya, ja, nice brew. That's what you say in Johannesburg if you're ill educated. <laughs> oh, brew, that's really nice. Hey? That's lovely. Beautiful. There's a lot of ganooing and uh, some high pitched and some low pitched. The highest pitched ones I can hear are going. <laughs> the lowest ones, really sort of bull like. <laughs> oh, Manu, the sun is about to drop down below the cloud line there. Shho! And Rebecca is going to be soy amazed once again. Now she's going in a very South African fashion. She's going, yo, 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 which means that's amazing. Stunning. Now I can hear a little bit of alarm calling. But I mean, if the lions get in amongst this bunch, there's going to be absolute chaos. Isn't that? Let's try and get a little closer in if you can, Manu. I know it's going to play with your exposure horribly. There we go. Just dropping below the cloud line. Gosh, that is amazing. Now let's we can pull back out again. You can show us the canoes. Mm. Now, before I answer Andy's question, I just need to tell Manu, of course, that it is illegal for me to be taking photographs on drive uh, because it distracts me from my presenting. So when I am breaking the law, you're please not to put the camera on me. Is that, is that, okay, thanks very much, that's great. Um, <laughs> Andy, sorry, I missed your question as I was caught there doing an illegal thing. What was it again? We'll carry, we'll answer it shortly. Apparently, I think the cheetah are on the move. Well, the cheetah are certainly not on the move. The wildebeest are. Now, what is going to happen? You literally saw the front wildebeest start streaming past these cheetah, and there's a lot more to come. I'm guessing there's still about another hundred wildebeest that will come streaming past these cheetah, and most of the young wildebeest are at the back of the herd and as soon as a youngster strays close enough to them I think these guys might surge at them look at the way they flattened themselves to the ground the wildebeest it's hard to believe but they've got no idea whatsoever that these cheetah are here and there's five of them only about 30 meters away Oof. now what is going to happen it's not as dark as it usually is when these guys really start revving the herds so that's possibly why they're still a little bit apprehensive but at any moment they may see a youngster that they see fit for dinner and they could surge forward and when they do the herd starts kind of running around they don't flee completely they almost run around in circles because they're not hugely intimidated by the cheetah so they just get an initial fright and it's then that they start kind of churning the, through these wildebeest until they manage to find a youngster, bring it down. Some of you may have seen the footage of 
one of the cheats are getting bowled over by a mother wildebeest who came back to rescue its youngster. So wildebeest will stand up against these cheetah. Not always, but certainly from time to time. I cannot believe how incredible this is. What a beautiful, beautiful evening it is here in the Masai Mara. I'm told you are enjoying a wonderful sunset with James. So while the action awaits us, we will show you the view from where we are perched at the moment. Isn't that spectacular? Beautiful. I'm glad James isn't getting wet. You can see lots of rain out in those clouds over there. So he's obviously a little bit further north, I'm guessing. Very, very good. So there's still about another 50 or 60 wildebeest, I'm guessing. Not easy to be certain how many. And I can't believe these cheats haven't done anything yet. But that is the beauty of it. You may think you're getting to know these animals and may predict or have a guesstimate as to what they are going to do. But very often they prove us wrong. Very, very windy afternoon again. This will assist the cheetah. Did the one on the right there try to kind of swivel itself to the side? It didn't, it wasn't the most graceful move, but it did definitely swivel itself pointing more towards the wildebeest. Maybe that one's going to surge first. Oh, there's a warthog. <laughs> Best you get out of there, buddy. Although, I think these guys really have become wildebeest hunting experts. And be ready, because at any moment now, one of them could surge forward. Most of the young wildebeest I was talking about are starting to stream forward now. Ooh. This one here in the middle of the screen now strays too far away from any of the big ones. I think they may have a go at it. Watch that cheetah on the right. It seems to be getting the most prone and ready. I wonder what's going through their heads. Wouldn't that be nice to know? There's no ways they can be communicating with one another now, I wouldn't think. But individually, all of them are expre or displaying incredible patience. And this is a skill that even the fastest mammal on the planet, or fastest land animal on the planet needs to be able to succeed in bringing down some prey. Ooh, that's a small one there. Shoof, you are lucky for now, it appears. Oh, have they got a fright? This may trigger a chase. For a lot of predators, if their prey don't run for them, from them... Oh, here they go! Here they go! Can you believe it? Just out of nowhere. You stay on that front one, VM. I'll keep an eye on the others. Yeah, it's going. It's going to get it. Oh! Can you believe this? What a takedown! It looks like the other one might be going for another. They've got... Have they got two or is it just the one? No, they've just got the one. The others are coming back to help. Well done, VM. I'm going to get us in there a little bit closer. Hold tight, everyone. I was supposed to do that quicker. I've gotten off to a slow start here. <laughs> I was so busy looking for others. There's a lot of vehicles also getting in. I don't want to put too much pressure on them, but it looks like everyone's stopping at a healthy distance. So that's the good news. Let's see if I can get the sunset behind. That's going to be a bit of an ask. So we'll skip that. This is a big wildebeest. They've still got their work cut out. That was such an incredible tackle and couldn't, can you believe how just out of nowhere they surged forward. Oh, this may be hard for some of you, but it is nature. There's nothing we can do about this. They are trying to kill this wildebeest as quickly as they can, but I fear it may take some time. This is the biggest wildebeest I have seen them attack so far.
now what we must all be aware of is that this wildebeest bleats that it's letting out now as saddening as it is to hear it is also going to lure in any hyena or lion that may be in this area so i'm scanning around just making sure that no hyena come barreling in or even worse than that any lion we've seen this coalition of five male cheetah lose a kill to just one single hyena that already fed on most of it but that is something we need to be aware of can you believe how quickly and precisely that all unfolded it was certainly the cheetah on the far right who was showing the most interest in making this kill that surged out of the blocks and what an incredible takedown that was incredible camera work to VM these things all happen so quickly and it's something that none of us are practiced in hence me taking two minutes to drop the clutch and get us here but well done to VM incredible camera work and well done to this coalition of the wildebeest machines wildebeest machines wildebeest killing machines and for those of you on a lighter note, who are worried that Wildebeest is now going to retire, Vim, the cameraman, Wildebeest, aka Wildebeest, he is not. I was just joking around. It's just a joke that he said he would retire after he gets a good cheetah takedown. And I think that was certainly worthy of his joke. This is interesting because the squabbling behavior around the kill is something that is new to us. We haven't spent a long time with this coalition of cheetah, but only in the last week or so. Look at these two having a go at one another. All the beast isn't dead yet, so they should try and focus on doing that. I don't think it is dead. Though it must be close. It looks like Dartonian, the male with the collar, is going to show them how it's done. Yeah. Now, this behavior, we don't know who's who yet, and it's difficult in a chaotic sighting like this for me to even have a guess. But obviously, the male with the collar is easy to distinguish. He is one of the biggest of these five. And there is another big one. So there's two that are distinctly bigger than the others. And it looks like he's been showing that slightly smaller one. Who is boss? You can see that one's trying to beg its way in. You see, I think this is another of the more mature males that's gone in on the chokehold now. They obviously... They're obviously not convinced that it's dead yet, nor am I. What was that, VM? Okay. So VM just had to, what is called, drop an ND filter. So basically just assisting with the lessening light as the sun has just set. Well, everyone, what can I say to be able to witness a live cheetah hunt from the Masai Mara again is just the most phenomenal thing and I'm so so grateful to be sharing this with you we are so so lucky to be seeing these five cheetah do their business and it looks like the long hours spent Archer has already paid off I'm still continually scanning to make sure no hyena come onto the fray. It could happen at any point in time. Hello to Mia. You'd like to know if there are any lion or hyena around in the general area and that I know of, and no, not that I know of. 
but one thing I can tell you is that there's no shortage of both of those animals in the Masai Mara ecosystem, especially hyena. So it's, there's a strong possibility one will come onto the fray. The wind could be helping these cheetah in terms of it muffling the sounds of this wildebeest bellowing or, or bleating, and it will also be muffling the sounds of their argument, which attack, uh, attract some attention. And they're so busy fighting over one another, they're not forgetting to kill this wildebeest. ...behavior. I wouldn't like to be those two with their tails towards us and their heads away from us. They could catch a stray hoof at any point in time. Oh, here comes the first hyena on the left, Vim. Already the first hyena's here. And on cue, what is it going to do? Is it going to charge in and try and chase them all off alone? It's just doing the maths first. It is coming closer now. It's cleverly probably going to come behind the vehicles using a bit of our cover to sneak up on them and it may well try and call in reinforcements and other hyena like oh here it comes on the VM on the left now they haven't had a mouthful of this look at this very characteristic maneuver that the cheetah use they lift their front legs up high and slam them down onto the ground to make themselves look more fierce and impressive now, is this hyena going to be greedy, keep quiet, and to the rest of the clan for reinforcements? It's an, it's an interesting scenario that plays out that a hyena has options to be selfish or to be greedy. If he calls in the rest of the clan, it knows it's going to have its work cut out for it. Lots of competition. This cheetah also knows it needs to start eating as quickly as possible. I wonder how that hyena got the message. Was it the sound? It must have been. The wind is blowing in that direction, so it could have blown those moans and groans of the wildebeest towards wherever that hyena was resting for the afternoon or the day. And I'm not convinced that these cheetah are going to get much of this meal. I think there's going to be more hyena coming in and who knows, that may mean another hunt this evening. Once darkness has fallen, very, very interesting prospects, that is for certain. Whew. Well, I think all of us need to take a deep breath and compose ourselves after that manic action. It's been such a calm and pleasantly slow afternoon safari I would like to say at least from my point of view it has you've had the joy of jumping on board with Tristan and James but things have just taken a rapid rapid spike in excitement and adrenaline and emotion Whew. the hyena still just sitting off on the side there patiently and it appears like it is taking the selfish route as opposed to calling in the rest of the clan to chase off these hyena. Cape Turtle Dove, you would like to know what hide is the toughest to break through. I'm guessing most of your general kind of antelope have got similar thickness hides. You know, wildebeest and topi will be on a par and zebra, maybe buffalo slightly thicker. And then, you know, rhino, hippo and elephant will have the thickest of the skins to try and get through. It does appear like they are having a tough time getting through this. I think age also makes a difference. I think the older the wildebeest, the tougher the skin becomes, whereas the younger wildebeest might be a little bit softer and more supple to open. It appears that is the case. These guys are having trouble getting in here. There's great news. Tristan has been tirelessly tracking while we've been enjoying the sighting of these cheetahs. So why don't you go and have a look what he's found you. From the dam having down here, Now, we've just managed to find 
a spotted surprise for all of you. So I'm going to try and see. Hopefully she's not going to drop down into the Mulawati. But it looks like Tandi. I haven't seen very nicely. But I'm going to try and just see. There she goes. You can see her just going in front of me. So it does look like her. So she's just disappearing into the darkness now. Sorry about the little bit of a breakup in picture. I'm going to quickly just shoot around to the other side of the Mulawati. Because I'm not going to be able to keep up with her. So I just want to quickly get around. So just hold on. Little Ferrari Safari for two seconds. So she's just on the western side, well at Tundam she's on the eastern side. Now Tumba is in Torchwood and he's moving west. So I wonder if we're not going to get a situation where we're going to get both of them meeting up together again. So we're just going to try to see if we can't get around. It is a long way from again than we had earlier. Oh, guys, a little bit bumpy. Sorry scrub here. All right, and down we go into the Mulawati. Okay, now Tandy, be nice to us. Don't cross in a horrible place and don't go too quickly. All right, now I do need to find later today so we're not going to have a little last minute left but we're going to get there hopefully well sorry about that shaky signal down in Juma but at least you've got some good action here and well done to Tristan for getting you at least a glimpse of that leopard it seems like they're slowly making their way through the thick hide of this wildebeest but they certainly are finding it harder than any of the other young wildebeest that I've seen them snack on. The hyena is still waiting patiently on the outskirts and all you've missed is a few little squabbles between this coalition and I'm hoping that all the squabbling we're seeing isn't the beginning of the end of this coalition. It's not uncommon for coalitions to join up for periods of time and then obviously as relationships either, I guess, dwindle, they can then split up and go off on their own in smaller groups. So that may happen. And again, further reason for us to really be gracious that we get to see this many cheetah together it's not the norm and to see such efficient killing again is neither is not normal either now you'll hear possibly quite a few vehicles starting up people are heading back towards their respective camps yet we do not have to we are here the whole night so Fear not, we are not going anywhere, and again, very, very fortunate that we've got special privileges to be out after dark. Hello again, Roshni, good to have you on safari again. You would like to know how long after this chase would they need to cool off? Well, it doesn't look like they need to cool off at all. They've gone straight from the chase, it was a short chase. They're, you know, as far as cheats go, they can have to chase things for far longer than it did in this situation. I would say that was probably only about 100 meters or so that it had to run. It's a very cool evening, and as you can see, all of them have taken no time to get their breath or cool off. And I'm actually told it's more of a, a kind of old wives tale that cheats need to cool off. I mean, of course, they need to catch their breath, but they don't run the risk of overheating, which I think is quite a wide, at least that's a recent document that I read. It's a bit of a, a misnomer. It's not the case. Their body temperature doesn't really rocket to the point that they're going to self-combust. They'll obviously be out of breath and possibly a little bit tired but they don't need to cool down as much as a lot of us believed was the case. Okay, well, it's turning out to be a big cat evening from 
A glimpse of a leopard on Juma to these five cheetah and now across to James with some lion. Yes, some lions indeed, an astoundingly with some signal and not far from the wildebeest herd. Now this is a mating pair from the Salt Lick Pride and we know they're mating because we have, uh, well, we've seen them mating, basically. And I think that she looks relatively hungry and she's just perked up and the rest of the pride is the other side of this sort of marshy spot and I don't think there'll be any signal near them. So. I think what we're going to do is wait and see if she doesn't go hunting. Uh, often with a mating pair, the female will go hunting. You know, it's exhausting work mating as a lion. Uh, many, many times a day it must be done. You can see the male completely exhausted. And she, uh, well, she looks a little bit like she could uh, eat something before the mm, new mating commences. So I think we'll sit with these two and wait and see what happens. There are two large groupings of wildebeest around here. One to the left of your screen and one, the one we were with, is just sort of behind us. And so rather like Scott was waiting with the cheetahs during the day, we are going to wait with these lions for a while at the night and see what happens. We'll give them a little while before we try the rest of the pride, but having seen where they are, I think that they're just not going to be able to give us any workable signal. She's looking up towards them, I wonder. Just listening carefully to see if they aren't some alarm calls. They're a long way from here, probably about 300 meters or so, about a thousand feet. And she might be listening to see if there isn't signs or sounds of a kill. Because she'll quite happily scavenge from the family. can see night just starting to fall. What an astounding day uh, you've had there with those cheetahs. Isn't that amazing? Once they get, decide that they're going to hunt a herd of wildebeest, it's almost certain that they will k kill. Hello, love. Hello, darling. What's for dinner? How oh, I got nothing yet. Oh, Rita, you say, when there's a mating pair, do the other lions move off in order to give the lovers some space? Uh, Rita, I don't think it's anything quite like that, no. I think what happens is that these two become so preoccupied with each, with each other that the others just kind of get on with the rest of their lives. And he will sometimes try and separate her from the rest of the pride. You know, he'll kind of block her way. And then I suppose by default they do become separated often not very far away from the rest of the pride and she's looking straight towards them now and in fact she's looking at a jackal there's a jackal off to the left there can you see it there Manu? I'm not sure if the... can you see it? way or... no 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 much further left in the clearing behind us there in there somewhere there is a little pair of jackals, and that's what she's looking at. There you go. Well spotted. And there's a, a, there is actually a carcass there, an old carcass. That is uh, smelling very high indeed. And that's what the jackal's eating. Lion is licking her chops, but I don't think the chances, the chances of her catching jackal for dinner are, well, highly unlikely. Here we are. See, licking her chops. I definitely think she's quite peckish. He's watching the little jackals now. The jackals are very fast, so they would be able to escape from her almost always. Although lions do take their toll, we know, of course, that horrendous scene we saw with Brent when, at Juma when the lions got hold of a wild dog pup. Dreadful, dreadful stuff. So they do take their toll on the canids out here. Right, now, either this is a prelude to more mating, or perhaps it'll be a prelude to hunting. We're just putting on the infrared now, it's getting a bit dark, so things are going to go from vibrant technicolor to black and white. 
I'm not sure why she's licking her lips quite so uh, enthusiastically. She looks like she might be sick, actually. Well, that'll make her definitely peckish after that. Now, that is the thinnest belly I have seen on a lion during this migration season. And I think this lion is about to have a vom. That's disgusting. Oh, goodness, here it comes. He's not put off in the slightest. I certainly am. Right, now what's going to happen here? Oh no, the IR lights on. Yep. Yes, they are. Is the is the IR filter on? Yes. Is it on full auto? Yep. Yeah. It is quite dark though, I must say. Anyway, um, let's reverse back a little bit. They're going to mate. Here we go. Here we go. I must tell you, the smell around here is not that of a kind of, um, there's no romantic smell around here. It smells like rotting meat and lion dung, which is quite the worst smell in the world. Yeah, I think she's hungry now. I'm not sure this mating malarkey is holding her fascination, really, at the moment. I don't know if you can hear that low, throaty growl. No, go away, she says. I have a headache. Manu, now that is black. We can see nothing. What's happened there? Manu? They're mating. There we go. Romance in the dusk. Often, you know, they mark their territory like that, as the mating happens, the males do, just to sort of assert themselves. It almost looks like they feel slightly inadequate afterwards from the aggressive response they receive, so they mark their territory to show how big and tough they are. Marvellous. Well, I'm glad we got to see that. What I think I might try and do is sneak around to the others just to see if we've got signal. I'm 90% sure we won't. And so while I do that, let's head across to Scott and find out how his cheetah's, um, well, migration banquet is going. Well, the banquet has officially begun. They have managed to wake, work their way through the blazer of this Poor Gnu, VM. Oh, I think, I think, what am I hearing? Is it them? Is it a hyena? Or is it... It could be the cheetah chattering to one another. I just heard a strange noise, apologies. Um, VM quite hysterically said that these <laughs> cheetah feed like silkworms. <laughs> <laughs> and to be honest, I think it's a great analogy. Compared to a lot of the other carnivores out here, how they eat, the cheetah are very petite. They don't ever get too dirty or bloody. And much like a silkworm nibbling on a leaf of a mulberry tree. Kind of. I thought it was great. Um... Now, how much of this will they get to feed on? That, for me, is the begging question. Also, what's boggling my mind is that this hyena is clearly not much of a team player. If you just let out a few howling whoops or their hysterical laugh, that would certainly get other hyena in the area 
on board and then they would be able to override these cheetah very easily. Like I said, one single hyena has managed to move these cheat drive these cheats or off a kill before in all fairness it wasn't as fresh as this they had already been feeding on it for about half an hour most of it was finished and i guess maybe by then they worked out that it's not worth the risk of trying to keep the hyena at bay this guy you know i guess there's two sides to the story because it knows that if it does get all of this to itself, there'll be lots of bits that the cheetah cannot feed on. So it's probably actually more than enough. All it needs to be is patience and it'll get a lot of food here that, like I say, the cheetah's little jaws, will, little uh, silkworm jaws will not be able to cope with. Something that I'd also love to know about these cheats, and it will be possible to work it out with a little bit of time and in, uh, effort, <clears throat> is which cheetah makes the most kills. We've seen definitely the collared male. He showed us a lot of uh, kind of, he was the kind of leader of the hunts when we initially started spending time with him. But now it looks like, oh, you see, he's drinking the blood there, which is also quite interesting. I think they are really enjoy drinking blood where they can. When they break open a vein or an artery, they just sit and lap up all the blood that comes shooting out. We noticed one doing that on a Thompson's Gazelle, one of the two sisters when they caught a Thompson's Gazelle a couple of nights ago. Again, that was a kill made after dark. Oh. And they go growling and squabbling. I'm just going to keep quiet for a second. It could intensify. Now, what will definitely be happening as the minutes unfold is that the smell of this carcass is going to be carried very far, very quickly. With this howling wind, any hyena to the west of us is going to know that there's a fresh wildebeest up for grabs. So, again, I wonder how long it may take for a whole clan come rushing in. It'll be very interesting to see uh, two or three more hyena come into the fray to see what these cheetahs do, whether they stand together as a team or if they just rely on one individual to do all the dirty work. Hello, Gene. You'd like to know if the cheetah would prey on the hyena? No, it's highly, highly unlikely. And I'm fairly certain the only hyena that would have been killed by a cheetah will be small cubs or very young kind of six-month-old hyena. A fully grown hyena I don't think is a match for a cheetah. Not even five of them, to be honest. Um, although it would be an interesting match. Um, I've never heard of any documented records of cheetah killing hyena certainly it can happen the other way around and it definitely happens with lion and leopard lion and leopard can quite easily kill cheetah as a general rule see it depends on the circumstances um but no i don't think cheetah have it in them to be able to attack and kill a hyena certainly stand up to them where they can try and chase them off but i don't think they have the strength to be able to dispatch one. Hello to David. You would like to know if eating the stomach acids of this wildebeest is dangerous for the cheetah. Um, I guess there's two answers to that question. One is that, no, it's not dangerous, and they can eat it. The second option would be that it is dangerous, and they know not to eat it. Um, basically, I don't think so, because we, they would know if it was, and they wouldn't eat it. So I don't think it's something they have to worry about. Another thing is that they generally don't feed on the stomach content. 
and the stomach acid would only be within the bag of rumen full of grass which is of no desire which is of no desire or well, the cheats will have no desire to eat that so that will be removed at some point in stage that it's that ooh, it was just the wind the when you may have seen that big bag there it's just behind the cheetah that's lying down on the left and that is would be filled with most of the stomach juices and acids so they don't feed on that other animals may break it open and eat that stomach lining but leave the rumen the content the cud that they, the wildebeest would have been chewing on but I've never heard of any animals having problems from feeding on this I guess their digestive systems along with everything else is probably far tougher than ours as humans all these cheetah have been very very fortunate in that more hyena have not come into the fray are we on infrared now VM not quite okay hello Kurpool you would like to know what drinking does for the predators it makes their life easy blood is a ooh, what have they seen any any changes yes here they come oh no <laughs> it's a family of warthog I thought it was three hyena coming barreling in the cheetah are lucky and I guess the hyena is to a degree as well and still has this all to itself or the leftovers so Kurpool, the, the benefits are it's High, high it's very very high in protein and it doesn't need to be chewed so it's a great source of minerals nutrients protein basically in the form of a smoothie I guess if you could equate it to something that us humans are enjoying at the moment smoothies are kind of quite the rage you see that is really interesting they they obviously saw those three warthog and just went bolting off rather than taking a chance. Oh, you see that lightning in the background? It's all happening here. Keep scanning around, please, Vildi. I just want to make sure it was just the warthogs. Um, nothing else to be seen. No lions. Their senses are far better than ours. Huh. Check where the cheats are, sorry, Vildi. Surely they haven't gapped it. No. This is bizarre. They're crazy. They are looking back now. Come on, guys. That was the biggest false alarm ever. There's three warthogs that are approaching. And the hyena also even ran away from the warthogs. Maybe these are the not very well known about killer warthogs of Kenya. Carnivorous warthogs. <laughs> because it sent one hyena packing and five male cheetah off into the distance. Well, I'm torn as to what to do. I guess we might have to stay with the cheetah because that was our plan initially. And no guys I'm just gonna reverse a bit just to really open up the scene for them just so that that there's nothing here really really strange I was kind of you know considering where they ran off to, I guess the vehicle would have been a bit of a barrier that they wouldn't have been certain of anything hiding behind so let's just stop here have another look at the cheetah, please, VM. Yeah, I'll scrap that in case the cheetah do come because I, I, I will all go and then, then we're done for the evening. I just want to see if they're thinking of coming back now that I've opened up their view. Hmm. Well, I guess the wind, the darkness, VM's using a very, very fancy camera with a ridiculous lens on it. So it's making it look like it's 5.30 on a cloudy afternoon. But the sun sets just about an hour ago, or at least half an hour ago. And 
it's far, far darker in real life. Okay, let's have one squiz. It seems like they are not going to be hanging around, which means we need to stick with them. But I just want to see if the hyena has cashed in yet. <laughs> they did quite well. I mean, they've got a decent chunk of that wildebeest into their bellies. Okay, well, how bizarre. Very interesting, and again, what an absolute privilege and a pre pressure to share that all with you. The joys of the unknown safari, live safari action, just I can't get enough of, and I'm loving having you guys alongside. Woo-wee! Okay, have you got them there, VM? Well done. Where are we? Two-ish, three-ish. Okay. So, what I'm doing is I drive with my headlights on, obviously so I can see the road, and then what my goal is is to get the cheetah parallel to us so that I'm not shining the lights on them as we move therefore they are snooping about essentially just with the vehicle tagging along adjacent to them it seems like they've calmed down as would I after having had a big wildebeest snack that they absolutely wolfed down and again, I'm just going to park on the side of them that allows them to still look back in the direction of that kill. They may decide to go back there once the initial fright wears off. Well, who knows? Maybe they're going to hit off and claim another GNU to fill the gaps that they hadn't quite got to yet. Yes, as Bex cleverly puts it they were just having a light starter and the evening is only just beginning okay I think we will not be in their view here hello Cape Turtle Dove you would like to know if the Ma the Mara cheetah are any bigger than cheetah elsewhere in Africa and I'm not sure I don't have the faintest idea your reason for asking is because there's more prey around uh, yes there is but not always the migration is not always here it's here for two or three months of the year when your average pride or coalition or predator will be able to cash in on it the other nine months of the year can be quite bleak in the Mara, relatively speaking. And because some areas have such good rain and such long grass, the lions, cheetahs, leopards in those habitats or in those areas don't have nearly as much food. It's too swampy. A lot of the food moves outside of the reserve and the triangle into the surrounding conservancies, I'm told. So it's not always a time of plenty, and I've heard that some of the prides of lion can get quite thin outside of the migration. So, yes, for three months of the year, it's the place to be if you're a carnivore. However, there are also some tricky months. Now, we've got a very cool toy called a FLIR, which is a heat-sensitive camera i.e. thermal imaging camera and there we go isn't it quite fascinating i love the way their tails kind of disappear because obviously there's not too much heat traveling down to the tip of that and a very very useful toy to assist us in being able to keep an eye on these animals and the lions and who knows whatever everything else that moves around after dark without impacting on what they get up to so we've got two cameras mounted on top of one another through some ingenious safari live tech work um, that's basically been built for the job and the thermal camera sits on top 
of the low light infrared camera so wherever vm is pointing one camera he's pointing the other what would help is if we could grow two more arms and hands for him so that two hands could control the focus and the zoom of the bottom camera and the other two focus hands could focus the thermal so He's doing some great multitasking. Look where it's just rolled over. There's still a heap. Oh, no, sorry. You've gone back onto the other camera. Whoops. But <laughs> when, they, when, they, when they do roll over, you can see where they've been lying on the ground. I'm very, very impressed by the technology. And it's only going to get better. And the technology that's becoming available to us is really going to open up the doors to show you guys and learn with you guys some fascinating fascinating stuff that people don't actually know about up until now people haven't been able to spend time with animals like these without interfering in their business after dark if you're shining a big spotlight around of course you're creating a huge amount of attention to the predator you are either blinding the prey so as a general rule the less lights after dark the better well well done guys you, ha you had a very successful evening hunting I commend whichever one of you did that incredible tackle and persisted in taking down that wildebeest after initially missing it I thought it was going to give up John you would like to know if this coalition will break up after the migration passes through it could well, but I think it will be through default. Well, I guess it could be spearheaded by the fact that there's less food, therefore more quarreling at mealtime. So I guess it could be a contributing factor to them breaking up. But there's no ways of being certain. All that I know is that they, jo they we don't know when they joined together, but they came into the area. They started being noticed by the researchers only in December. So very, very recently, Dartonian, the individual with the collar, I think was only collared in January or February. Oh, sorry, I was putting my hand over my lapel, my little microphone there so you couldn't hear me. Um, so yes, Dartonian, this individual was collared in February. So I mean, it's all very, very new. Um, this coalition to the area, to the researchers, and we're not entirely certain what the future holds for them. What I do know is that as long as they stay together, we are going to get spoiled with some crazy, crazy action. I wonder if we shouldn't rush back to that carcass and see what's happening there. Because we should be able to keep an eye on them. Hmm. I'll just answer Take Care's question and then I'll make up my mind unless any of you would like to let me know what you would like to do should we stay or should we go i'm confident we're not going to lose the cheetah in their current state so now we're back onto the FLIR, the thermal imaging camera and you'd like to know why the ears are showing up hotter than the rest of the body and I guess it's the inside of the ears, it's not the outside of the ears. So you see the outside of the ear, which we're looking at now, is warm. It's probably because it doesn't have too much fur, but it's the inside of the ear. The white is the hottest color. Oh, it looks like they're going back. Oh, there's the, there's the little hot patch on the ground I was talking about that gets me so excited. <laughs> um, cool. Well, it looks like the cheetah are going to escort us back towards the kill. Let's go and see what happens. I'm just going to follow from a, from a generous distance behind them. The reason being is that the vehicle noise is going to have an impact on how they're feeling, on any noises, warnings. So it's very important that I just keep back a little bit so as to not muffle any important sounds that they may be listening to. Okay, where are they, BM? Cool, thank you. So they are heading back in that direction. Very, very interesting. 
You would think they would have just not run so far away initially. Are they actually even going to go back and have a look? It appears like they could well be. I'll just stop again. I just want to let them have a chance to listen and make sure they know what they're doing. So the scan as well as the thermal. Oh, sorry guys, I'm told that every now and then the picture drops. That's just to keep you guys on the edge of your seats. Only kidding. We're in a very low-lying area and obviously the signal is not great here, but the action is, so it's a small price to pay. There we go. VM has found the carcass and the hyena seems to be tucking in. Let's try and use the thermal. Ah, oh, that's working marvelously. The thermal camera, the flare. Now we are far, far away. I'm guessing like 500 meters, 400 meters. So it gives you an idea of how effective this machine is. Well, you enjoy your snack there, hyena. The cheetah are all looking on, kind of wondering what to do next. Wonderful. Well, how interesting and how lucky are we to see this action? And just interesting behavior. The fact that, you know, they can obviously see that far because they're confident in that they're looking at something. Whether they can work out what exactly it is, I'm not entirely certain. But what I can assure you is that that hyena is having a great great time stumbled upon an easy meal of which there are lots in the Mara at the moment and it seems like everything is coming to a not a grinding halt but a slowing down to a leisurely pace just at the right time because it is about to say it is about time to say goodbye I'll get there eventually it's about it's about to say goodbye to all of you and thank you for joining in on what's been an epic epic safari well done to Tristan on all his contributions as well as James and thank you very much to Bex in the final control well done on another epic safari we will see you all in the morning